Hello there. What is going on, everyone? Today we're going to be doing a ship breakdown for the Pelta, aka the Phoenix Home, as we've seen it in the Rebellion in the show Star Wars Rebels, as well as a, uh, a ship that you may have seen in the Clone Wars, although this is the Rebel version of it with the wings open. Uh, most of the time that we see it, uh, it makes its debut in to Star Wars Armada for the Rebels, although it is, there is a version also available for the Republic. If you're looking for the Republic version of this one, I'm going to refer you to my Star Wars Armada Ship Breakdowns playlist, which I'll be linking towards the end of the video. Of course, if you want to just make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on all that good stuff, be sure to do that. We, are, uh, we do a lot of Star Wars Armada Ship Breakdowns, as well as a lot of other gameplay and tutorial videos here on the channel, so I'd love to have you stick around, plus lots of other tabletop gaming and Star Wars gaming videos as well. We're currently giving away a $25 Amazon gift card. If you haven't already, you just have to be a subscriber and leave a comment on this or one of my videos in order to enter to win that. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and dive into this ship breakdown. So uh, the, the Phoenix Home, a.k.a. the modified Pelta, does show up in Star Wars Armada. It came to the Rebels first, although the Republic did eventually get their version. So if you want to check that out, uh, I have a whole playlist of other Star Wars Armada ship breakdowns you can check out, and uh, I'll, I'll put links at the end of the video. Uh, but this ended up being a kind of a small ship plus. It's kind of a tanky little small ship in that it has five hull instead of four, like most small ships do. Plus it has a brace. Having an, e, uh, an evade and a redirect plus a brace allows this ship to survive a little bit more than most small ships tend to. Uh, now, it isn't the fastest ship, it's only capable of going speed 2, but it does have fairly good maneuverability for the two uh, maneuvers that it can do. Now, it's a two-command ship, uh, which means you're not going to be able to re react on the fly, but you'll still have fairly quick reaction speed with the command value of 2. Uh, and it's uh, also a four-engineering ship, which means that uh, it kind of pairs it to where it was almost a medium ship and as far as its survivability and tankiness. Uh, it does have three shields in the front, two shields in the side, and only one shield on the rear, so it generally does want to be flying towards its opponent. Now, with, with the fact that it's somewhat tanky but still a small ship, uh, it can play the role as a flagship, it can also play the role as a support ship that both versions of this are featuring that fleet command upgrade, which is a very rarely seen upgrade in, uh, in on ships in the Rebellion as well as in ships on Armada in general. So whenever you do have a ship that has fleet command on there, you always have to take very special attention to that ship because it's kind of like the linchpin. It's like the ultimate support option for your whole fleet. Um, now, the uh, the Pelta itself, while it is on a small base, does have a pretty standard firing arc with a slightly larger front firing arc, uh, but still respectable side arcs and uh, a little bit more narrow of a rear arc, but uh, but still mostly pretty symmetric. It's uh, you know it's kind of kind of split up there normally. Now it's got most of its dice in the front and also most of its shields in the front, so it definitely does want to typically be pointed towards the enemy, but with only speed. Two, uh, its maneuverability, while decent, still kind of limits how far it can go now. Because it does have the support team, you can put something like engine techs on it to kind of make up for that shortcoming, although that does increase the cost. And cost is an important part of this ship, uh, because it is a small ship, but still has a lot of support and tankiness. Uh, it, it makes for a pretty good flagship if you're looking for maybe an MSU, which is multiple small units. If you want to have a lots, of, lots of ships out there, they usually tend to be pretty weak, and this one can maybe be the strongest among multiple small ships if you're running something like that. That's how uh, I've seen it run in uh, plenty of fleets, but it also makes for a great support anchor type ship because it's while it is a support ship, it's not usually easily killed. I want to take a look at the Pelta Assault Ship. This is our cheaper version, or the Black Die Pelta, as I'll sometimes refer to it. Uh, the assault ship has a number of differences. First, I want to talk about its cost. Uh, it's at 56 points. It makes for a very affordable ship. And usually, if you're bringing something like this, uh, a lot of times cost is definitely a factor. So for 56 points, I think this is the version of the Pelta that is more commonly taken. Uh, especially if you are trying to support multiple ships with the fleet command upgrade. Uh, you want to leave more points for more ships to get supported. Or if you're supporting squadrons, you want to leave as many points available to support those squadrons as you can. 
However, I think the modified Pelta class assault ship is more often taken when you want that fleet command to support ships more so than squadrons, uh, because this one only has a squadron value of one. Now, it is still two command and four engineering, but it's not the best at throwing squadrons around the board because it can only push one at a time. Uh, however, it does excel at doing damage to squadrons with its blue and black uh, anti-squadron battery. It means that it is going to have lots of extra dice to throw at squadrons. It is almost better at attacking squadrons than it is at attacking ships. But it's no slouch at attacking ships because the black dice in this ship's battery are formidable because they are augmented by the Ordnance Upgrade, which allows for some potentially strong hits from a ship that you might not think is that much of a threat. Now, two red and two black allow it to do a lot of interesting things. I tend to like to pair a ship like this sometimes with commanders that can take advantage of what we're seeing here. And one option is Dodana, since you have a lot of crit opportunity on black dice. Another option might be Sato, uh, with the fact that, hey, it's thematic, Sato was on board this ship, but Sato also can allow you to turn those red dice and the front into two black dice at long range and then allow your ordnance to potentially equip some black die critical effects. And now all of a sudden you're able to do some nice black dice damage and black dice criticals while at long range, especially if you're attacking an enemy ship that does not have the, uh, the evade icon, which is a pretty cool thing. Uh, but mostly the, the really nice things about this version is that it's cheaper, it has black dice, uh, and it can take ordnance, and also has pretty good flak. Now when we go into a slightly more tankier, or a slightly more um, expensive version, we're going to see the command ship here. Uh, we're going to notice a couple of upgrades on this one, as well as a downgrade. We're going to lose a black die in our anti-squadron battery. It does only has a single blue die, so not as effective at attacking... Uh, enemy squadrons, but it's going to cost a little bit more too. It's going to go up to 60 points. Not a huge jump, but certainly a jump. Uh, now, what, what do we gain from all of that? Well, we upgrade all of our black dice to blue. Well, you might not always consider that an upgrade because it's slightly less firepower. It also gives you a lot more range, and that is a big thing, uh, and especially with some of the upgrades that are available on this ship. Now, our command value goes from one to, or I'm sorry, our, our squadron value goes from one to three on this ship. So now all of a sudden, this is a, uh, a ship that excels at pushing squadrons. Uh, and, and if you wanted to use some kind of squadron benefiting command on this one, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, if you wanted to increase your fighter speeds, you could certainly do that with the fleet command. So it makes for an excellent candidate for that. Now, uh, another thing that's you're going to notice that's different about this ship is also that it loses the ordnance upgrade but gains the offensive retrofit. Uh, and that can allow for a wide variety of different configurations with this ship, whether it be something that is going to help you in the ability to push squadrons, which is often what offensive retrofit can do, or if you wanted to take advantage of the blue dice on here and put something like disposable capacitors is an also another option for the command ship. Uh, but generally, I think between these two, I think the bigger difference is that the Pelta class command ship is a little bit better for pushing squadrons, whereas... Uh, you know, our, our assault ship is a little bit better at the uh, close anti-squadron or anti-ship when you're at close range. And it has the, you know, both versions of it do have the survivability to potentially get into close range with that brace token and the extra shield on the front. Uh, now, I want to talk about the Phoenix Home title that's available for this ship as well. There's only one title, which is a little unfortunate because so many other ships had so many titles. Uh, sometimes it feels a little uh, like a letdown to have only a single title. But it is an interesting title at that. First off, it's only three points, so not too expensive. It's going to give you an extra officer icon in your upgrade bars, allowing the Phoenix Home to have two officers, which is extremely rare. Only the Super Star Destroyer and the Starhawk uh, can have more than one officer on them. So this is giving you that option. It puts you into a very elite category and opens up some very interesting list building combinations, especially as it applies to squadrons. I kind of like the Phoenix Home on the command ship a little bit more because there are some interesting rebel officers that can deal with squadron pushing tactics. And I kind of like that particular build. Um, it also gives you the secondary benefit of being able to as be assigned up to four command tokens instead of a number of tokens equal to your command value. So uh, normally, what this means, and I'm gonna, there's a distinction I want to throw out on this one too. Normally, you know, you're capped at if in a command two ship, you'd be capped at only two tokens. This one means that you can potentially get up to four tokens, although you are still limited 
in a, in a couple of in, you know key ways. You can't have duplicate tokens, right? So it's not uh, it's not the same as the executor. You can't you can't get two concentrate fires or whatever. So if you're you know, and it's nice to be able to have tokens because you'd want tokens to be able to fuel those fleet commands, but you can't get duplicates. So the, if you're going to get four, that's going to mean one of each. Also, if you're running Garm Bell Iblis, uh, you're not going to be able to just drop four tokens on this ship because Garm still gives tokens equal to their command value. And though the wording on this sometimes confuses people because it says what I can get for instead of my command value. Uh, well, this is just a referencing the limit of tokens you can get. This doesn't change what Garm Belliblis does because Garm Belliblis will specifically give this ship two tokens, not four. However, it doesn't make it bad. It's still a good ship to run with Garm because if you have two already, Garm can give you two more and this can max you out up to four provided they're one of each. Uh, but it is a good one to be able to stack tokens with. It works with other token generating shenanigans uh, and it works in a fleet, uh, works best in a fleet that is doing a little bit of everything, including pushing squadrons. Another reason why I like it on the command variant. I want to run you through a couple of different builds here and we'll take a look at, at some different ways that, uh, that you might want to consider building the Pelta. Uh, first up, I'll run a, a, a cheaper uh, Pelta class assault ship. A lot of times I'll run an assault ship with only intensify firepower and that's if I want to support a lot of other ships like maybe you got a couple of Nebulons or CR-90s, Hammerheads, things like that in your build and you want to be able to, all of them to be able to take advantage of this excellent fleet command. Um, you know, you want, but you'll probably want to do it for as few points as possible so you can fit more ships because every ship you fit in there is yet another ship affected by that fleet command. Uh, going cheap is a way to go. However, if it's a linchpin to your build, uh, your opponent's going to be gunning for it. So I put Lando on there to help it survive just a little bit more in case you get very, very unlucky. Uh, and also to deter opponents from getting too close to the Pelta Assault ship, I thought of putting external racks on there. Again, pretty cheap option, uh, and it gives you a really powerful punch. Uh, it's a once per game effect, so is Lando as a matter of fact, but both of those can help you either keep people away from you at close range, or punish them, or, uh, you know, or punish them for getting too close to you. Next up, we're uh, taking a look at a command ship that is part of something that I used to kind of call a Voltron build. And the idea for this came from the fact that when I first saw this ship and I first looked at the Imperial Star Destroyer 2, I said, hey, this is exactly half of the ISD-2. Uh, you know, it's got two red and two blue, whereas the IST-2 has two red or four red and four blue, you know, in the side arcs are also halves as well. And I said, well, if you take two of these together, it's the same as the ISD-2, except, you know, it could be a little bit better in, in certain cases to have two different... Um, you know, two different shots, because what if they each concentrated fire, then you could add two dice instead of one. And there's a lot of other little subtle distinctions, like one might be better for brace, one might not, uh, you know, against defense tokens, you know, and, and all of those things. So I thought that I would uh, kind of take a look at trying to run this one as an anti-ship version. Uh, the first thing I thought about is disposable capacitors, right? It's going to turn those blue dice into long-range dice, and so now all of a sudden you can, you know, it wouldn't be too hard to get a double arc on somebody, but even if you don't, even that front arc is now four dice at long range, rivaling a lot of Star Destroyers, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, to help us pack a little extra punch in there, we put an Intel officer on there, so it's like, all right, I'm a, you know, maybe I'll roll three or four damage on here. If you want to, if you're trying to try and cancel them with that evade, it's going to be gone. Or if you're going to try and brace this one, it's going to be gone. So Intel officer. It just adds a little bit of salt in the wound. Uh, and I thought the Auxiliary Shields team is just a nice one for this one to kind of pump those sides up and kind of treat this one a little bit more like, at least maybe like closer to a victory, uh, if we can get those side shields up to three at the beginning of the game, if we do an Engineer first turn. It kind of uh, gives us a lot more survivability and makes us feel a little bit more like a pretend Star Destroyer. Uh, and if you have two of these together, you really have uh, a nice little force. And if you can kind of fly them together, it might feel... Well, almost like you're running a Star Destroyer. Kind of that's where I come up with the Voltron build. If they were like, if they were like, if if the Star Destroyer were Voltron and then he broke down into the smaller lions, this would be one of them. That's kind of the idea. All right, um, going with a uh, a Sato assault ship. Uh, you know. He, it's it's kind of simple. Uh, I already kind of talked about this a little bit. How uh, you know those red dice in the front can be converted if as long as you've got squadrons, Sato can convert those into black dice. 
Uh, and I thought to myself, well, you know, let's go with assault concussion missiles. Really make those crits hurt. Really punish the opponent for those crits. Uh, I put engine techs on here so to get ourselves into position as quickly as possible. And then also uh, maybe to get ourselves free from danger if we need to as well. Uh, and I also put Draven on here. If I'm going offensive and I'm going and I'm, you know, I'm basically going with I want this ship to to have as much bite as I can. Uh, Draven's going to give in, improve what's already a really nice anti squadron pool. And since with Sato you usually want your squadrons to stay alive because he's allowing you to you know turn other dice into black dice. Um, enemy squadrons are definitely going to be a problem, and Draven's going to really help us add extra dice to that and uh, and have a really nice uh, attack pool when we're doing a. Uh, uh, basically an anti-squadron attack. So I thought that that's uh, a pretty uh, a pretty heavy-toothed kind of uh, Pelta build right there. And last but certainly not least, I decided to go with a big uh, sort of uh, big carrier squadron support version. Um, we are, we're running Phoenix Home on this one, again, on the command ship, which I think is the, probably the better place for Phoenix Home a lot of times, um, but certainly not always. Uh, for our offensive retrofit, I put boosted comms. This is a slightly slower ship, so I wanted this one to be able to uh, activate squadrons at long range. I put a fighter coordination team for our support uh, support team to help m push squadrons. Uh, we also have all fighters follow me. Again, uh, a lot of rebel sh ships want to go from like speed 4 to speed 5 or speed 3 to speed 4. This is going to allow us to do that. Uh, for our two officers, I went with flight commanders. This gives us, again, for slower ships, and if they get pushed too far up ahead, it allows you to stay safe and allows you to eventually move up into activation range and, and choose when you want to activate them, which is a very, very good thing to have. And I also put Adar Talon, which does definitely raise the cost of this build, but he is so good, especially if you've got somebody like Luke Skywalker or a really, really high-value squadron we usually, the, the more expensive the squadron to be able to double tap, the better, because it helps make up for the cost of Adar Talon as an officer. We have all of this on one really strong uh, carrier, and uh, this is, uh, and, and, and in addition to all of this, it's not a defenseless ship, too. It's still got the brace, it's still got a decent number of dice, and can still shoot at enemy ships as well. So it makes for a very well-rounded ship and a build like this uh, to support a squadron-heavy fleet. All right, guys, that does it for my breakdown of the Rebel Pelta, a.k.a. the Phoenix Home. I want to hear from you guys. Let me know some of the ways that you have run the Phoenix Home. And if you want to learn more, I invite you to check out our Discord. We have links in the video description below. Uh, so check that out and then jump into the community. Keep the discussion going there. Also, you can head over to crabock.com and get that free Armada AI expansion if you want to do that as well. I will talk to you guys later. I want to thank you all so much for watching and thank you for continuing to support the channel. Big thanks to my patrons. You guys are amazing. I couldn't do this without you, so thank you for your support. I will talk to you guys later. May the force be with you. Live long and prosper. Be excellent to each other. And so say we all. Goodbye there.